Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my awesome uh, dermatology and pathology residents, as well as my DermPath fellows, and we're going to look at some, some introductory random DermPath cases uh, for the start of the new academic year. So this is case one. Who wants to take this one? Um, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, so for the skin, uh, looks like we're looking at a dermal process, um, and even even from this power, you can see the thick pink um, collagen um, in there, and so I'm thinking a keloid for it, some inflammation, um, looks like chronic sort of granulomatous inflammation surrounding as well. Yeah, great. So this is a, a keloid, or um, t in my opinion, hypertrophic scars can look very much like keloids. Some people disagree and say that they shouldn't have keloidal collagen bundles. To me, the, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but keloid and hypertrophic scars are scars that get these, these, in my opinion, get these big bundles of collagen, and the distinction mainly is made clinically if the keloid is going to expand beyond the boundaries of where the scar was, and a hypertrophic scar kind of stays within the boundaries, right? But there you've got this big, thick, they're like reticular dermal collagen, but they're bigger, thicker, and like you said, that kind of uh, more rich color of pink. And in the background, there's reactive myofibroblasts and fibroblasts, sometimes with little red cells. Remember, scars have overlap with, uh, with reactive myofibroblasts um, and granulation tissue, which can look a little like fasciitis, sometimes nodular fasciitis. And so just like in nodular fasciitis, you get extravasated red cells. You can see that in scars sometimes. And um, always remember, don't stop with just one thing. There are a couple other bonus things here. What's this stuff? Um, I think that's catalog. It's got like yeah, exactly. Oh, this, is, this is injected <laughs> steroid, and it's these little pools of bubbly, frothy, um, uh, whitish material, and that's because steroids are you know lipid based basically. So so you get this frothy, uh, bubbly stuff because of the little uh, droplets of lipid that wash out in the processing, and you can uh, find these a lot of times in excised keloids because a lot of times people get their keloids treated first with injections and then then maybe they get them excised uh, later. And there are also uh, two other little bonuses. I don't know if they're that important, but up here we've got. A little actinic keratosis. We got some jumbled atypia along the basal layer, but it matures to little flat and squamous cells at the top, and then there's some parakeratosis over it. So maybe they had had uh, a squame or an AK or something excised here before. And also, interestingly, I noticed over here we've got some atypical cells along the base right here that seem a little bit more ugly than the regular AK. And over here, anyone know what this looks like? Yeah, EDV. Yeah, it looks like EDV, epidermodysplasia verusiformis. Although this one has um, kind of more uh, atypical looking keratinocyte nuclei than the average case. And I have seen a few times where squamous cell carcinoma uh, arising in a background of EDV had EDV like features, but was clearly ugly. Um, I find when cells have HPV, um, human papillomavirus cytopathic effect, their nuclei get large. And so it becomes harder to assess is that really atypia, like malignant atypia, or is this just the reactive, the, the cytopathic change from the HPV? And I don't know the history of this case, so I don't know. But for practical purposes, the blue-gray cytoplasm there is good for epidermodysplasia verusiformis. But I thought that was just interesting. The, this slide is in the study set as, as a keloid with triamcinolone um, steroid injection. But I thought it was interesting that there are a couple little background findings. All right, great. Dr. Gardner, can I ask you a oh, question? Yes. Um, if you just like, just had that epidermis there on the, on the left, um, like, you know, like I would go through like pagets and like other, other sort of things, even like Bowen's, like it, is it just the, just the, the, the blue gray color? Is that like really like the slam dunk EDV? Um, because I feel like pagets can kind of have that color too. Yeah, Paget's gets a little bit of a bluish color, but it um, it's a little subtle, but I do feel like it's kind of different. It's like a lighter. It's not this like deep blue-gray. That's one thing. Number two, Paget's usually um, will not be occurring in sun-damaged skin, right? It's usually going to be anogenital or nipple, and so that's a little bit cheating, but I mean, that's a, it's very, very rare to have pa true Paget's like, you know, adenocarcinoma cells in the epidermis in uh, you know a chronic sun exposed site and here we got solar elastosis so i am cheating a little bit i again i don't know the site on the body or the history of this case and in real life you could actually do stains if you had any concern and in fact if i just had this area here i would think of are we about to cut into a melanoma in situ 
or a squam in situ, or is this a really ugly AK? On this one focus, I can't tell actually. So here in real life, I, I might actually work this up a little more and get deeper levels to see if this evolved. I might actually add some comment that this looks like an incidental focus of Epidermodysplasia ruciformis, but there's more atypia than usual. And sometimes Bowen's disease or squam in situ can have EDV viral change. And so uh, maybe it would be good if this recurs to go back and take a little bit more or, or to take more now, depending on the situation. So those would all be considerations. But yeah, I have seen a case of Bowen's squam in situ that had EDV change, but was clearly full thickness and atypical. I'll have to pull that out sometime and share that. It's a, it was a pretty interesting uh, case. It was, a, if I recall, an immunosuppressed like transplant patient. So I think it made sense that they had the EDV viral, um, you know, the HPV viral types that were causing that epidermodysplasia of ruciformis type change, and then they were developing squamous cell carcinoma in situ in the context of that in their like sun damaged face, I think, and they were an older transplant patient with a you know immune suppression. So, so great question, great question, and all legit things and in real life you could definitely stain to sort that out. All right, case two. I can take this one. All right. So it looks like we're in the deep dermis. There is yeah. something actually within the dermis, almost in a cavity, surrounded uh -huh. by what looks like inflammation. And it just doesn't look like anything that the body would make. It looks foreign. Great. So this that's an important skill to develop, like to look at something and say, this does not belong here. There's no normal human thing that looks like this. Um, you may not even know what it is, but to say this is not from the body, that's, uh, that's very helpful sometimes. And the first time I saw this, I had no idea what it was, but um, <laughs> this is likely uh, suture, like Vicryl, because it has this like braided, braided appearance, cut and cross section. Well, you guys know the different suture types better than me, but I agree. This is a braided synthetic suture, and it's surrounded by kind of palisaded granulomatous foreign body reaction and inflammation. Um, the body does not like foreign stuff, including suture, um, and it tends to, to continue to attack it and surround it um, with, uh, with granuloma and inflammation and, you know, sometimes even will work its way all the way out to the skin and, you know, spit the suture out. I actually saw a case a long time ago in training of a patient that had, had a, a, they thought it was a cyst on the abdomen, and when we went to, to go to, you know, uh, uh, excise it, it turned out there was actually a big piece of suture there, and it had been from a, a C-section uh, like 30 years or something previously, like decades previously. The body never gives up. It never surrenders. It keeps fighting that totally innocent piece of suture forever. Isn't that amazing? Such, such an incredible uh, testament to the tenacity of the immune system. And I did pull up for you uh, here. Where is it? Ah, this is, this is what it looks like. Um, when you polarize that braided suture, not all suture will do this, but a lot of sutures, the synthetic ones, I think particularly, um, you get this like amazing rainbow of colors when you polarize. And for all the awesomeness of digital slides, to my knowledge, you can't polarize. And then here you can see this looks very similar to just what I was showing you. Um, and there's a little giant cell here. So I thought that's a pretty nice case. And usually when uh, it's the first time I show like junior residents, I put the polarizer in and turn it and I get appropriate oohs and ahs because of the, the rainbow of awesomeness that that happens there. Oh, and I forgot to mention earlier, but um, I do have a directory, like a library of all of my different videos and posts and stuff and I'm continuing to add to this. I've got one for Dermpath and uh, there's the link up there you can see and then one for soft tissue. So uh, if you're trying, I have, you know, like, I don't know, 400 videos or something now. So, so it's too much. I can't even remember sometimes which videos I have or where they are. But here I've got links to all of them to make it easy. You can just come to this page and search for whatever entity and see if I got a video or a virtual slide of it. So just FYI. All right, good. So suture. All right, what is this mess? We have little fragments of tissue, uh, probably curettings, uh, very like disoriented yeah. and can't really tell what's up, what's down. Um, but looking closer at some pieces of epidermis, there's some atypia. I had a hard time distinguishing, is this like AK, is this Bowen's? Um, there's some paric hair that's more suggestive of some like malignant or maybe like actinic process, but I was in between like curettings of AK, maybe maybe Bowen's in some areas. 
Great. Well, that... great. Well, that I, that's perfect, and I like that you're um, confused by it because that highlights the point that that's the downside of doing a curetting um, and submitting that for path instead of you know a, a shape biopsy or something. I and mean, I'm not saying it's always inappropriate, but if you're expecting a, a path answer, curettings are not going to be an ideal specimen, and it's going to be harder for us as pathologists to sort out what's going on and going to increase the likelihood that we're going to hedge and say, well, I'm not totally sure. Okay. So here, I agree with you. I think that if we take, and that's what, you know, when you, this is what it looks like when you submit the curettings, each little scrape is in here, and each one, it's impossible to embed them in a way that they're all perfectly oriented like we can with the shave. It's, you can't see what's up and what's down uh, uh, when you're looking at the little bits and pieces, so the histotechnologist can't embed it. There's no way to embed it so that they all get cut perfectly. So that means that some pieces you won't see the epidermis, and others you're gonna see the epidermis cut at a totally tangential angle rather than the straight vertical perpendicular line we normally cut through the epidermis down to the dermis and what we're used to seeing derm path uh, in that view here we're cutting at like a 45 degree angle or maybe even straight across to the base of the epidermis like right here that's how this part of the epidermis is connected there because it's like folded over and you're cutting across the whole bottom part of the epidermis it's kind of hard maybe to 3d visualize that but that's what's happening here so on these, what I have to do is look at any place that I can see a relatively reasonable orientation. And I see there's jumbled atypical basal keratinocytes here, kind of going down to nexal structures, but it seems to mature at the top. So I'd say at least we have AK here, actinic keratosis. I don't see any obvious full thickness. So maybe I'm not, not don't see anything that looks like obvious Bowens or squam in situ, but what about invasive squam? Sometimes we have actinic keratosis on top and it jumps straight to invasive squam without becoming squamous cell carcinoma in situ first. In fact, I see that often, right, um, in, in derm path. So it's, we kind of get taught that things should start with dysplasia, then become carcinoma in situ, then invasive carcinoma, like the, the model of dysplasia. Uh, progression to carcinoma that we learn in the cervix, uh, like in medical school. But in, in uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, they don't always work that way. Sometimes you get things that are full-blown Bowen's squam in situ that don't have any actinic keratosis precursor or any invasion. And then other times you have the pathway where it's like AK that, that suddenly invades and never gets full thickness. So what I would probably sign this out as, as um, uh, fragments of at least actinic keratosis. And, you know, with, uh, you can add a comment that, you know, it's difficult to interpret because it's curetted and I can't see the base of the lesion and uh, can't exclude the possibility of underlying invasive squame. Or sometimes with, with colleagues who are familiar with my reports, I just say at least actinic keratosis and they understand that that's a given that, that what I mean is that there could be something worse, but I can't see it. So I will say one, one shout out in the, in the defense of curettings is if you're going to do a shave biopsy and then curette afterwards, which I really quite like that. Um, and again, different people have different practice settings, but I actually like that if you're going to do that, A, if you can tell me that you've curetted after the shave, that's helpful because sometimes if I'm worried about one little area down a follicle or something, knowing that you've curetted helps maybe back me away from giving you a hedgy uncertainty answer if it's uh, if it's something that's pretty minor but it's kind of nagging at me I mean this is subtlety and I don't know maybe beyond what most people need to or want to know but in any case I definitely know there's times that when I know something's been curated um, afterwards it will change the way I word my report particularly in the setting of AK versus squam and stuff like that the other thing is that occasionally and you can, can I've only had occasional dermatologists in my career do this but I have found it helpful sometimes they would submit the shave and then they would take the curette fragments and swish that down into the form in, in the, the biopsy bottle. Then when it comes to the lab, my techs would take this, the shave biopsy, cut it in half, and embed it in one block. They'd strain all the little fragments out into a bag, a little biopsy bag, and put that into a second uh, cassette. And why that's helpful is sometimes on the shave, I'll say, well, this is at least AK, but it's transected, or it goes down a follicle. And then on the curette fragments, I'll see, oh, there's full-blown squame here, invasive. Then I can just, there's no hedging needed. I'll just say, this is definitely invasive squame. Or a basal cell where I think there's nodular basal, but then on the curetting, I, oh, I see infiltrative morpheiform pattern. I can give you an obvious answer of that now. So I've had multiple times where those extra fragments actually gave me more information and allowed me to give a more definitive diagnosis. Certainly you don't have to do that, but it, it can help. And I have, I've seen it more than once um, uh, where it actually ended up being helpful. And it really, to us, it's not a big deal. It's just one extra cassette, one extra slide. So, so not a major deal. So you might consider trying that out sometime if you like. All right. Any questions?
Dr. Gardner, All I was right, just going to ask case. if we do that, yes. is there anything we need to like denote on the requisition form or anything? Oh yeah, you can you can say that actually. Shave biopsy with curatage fragments um, submitted in same container okay, or something, perfect. and then the text. Um, and if the texts are not familiar, they'll they'll come and ask one of us. Usually, when there's something on the requisition form that is not usual, then the the pathologist assistant or the resident would ask one of the attendings, like, "Hey, how how should we handle this?" And then once they get used to that kind of submission, they'll know. But most of the time, PAs and uh, pathologist assistants and and uh, people grossing know that if there's fragments of something floating in a biopsy bottle, usually that gets submitted as a separate little thing through a strainer bag. So. But good point. It never hurts to give extra info. If there's any doubt that, that we might not figure out what's going on, always feel free to give more info. Uh, that's that, I almost never mind that. So, Okay. Case four. What kind of specimen is this? So it definitely looks like a, a clipping, um, like a nail clipping. Good. It's a nail clipping. Yep. It's a big, thick piece of nail plate, which is just compact keratin, which looks sometimes a little bit at first glance like a big, thick piece of stratum corneum, which is kind of what it's like, basically. A modified, super thickened piece of the same stuff the stratum corneum is made of, but it's a really, really thick and dense here. Good. And I'll tell you, you know, the first thing we get clippings for, right, is rule out onychomycosis, rule out fungus. So PAS or GMS stain would be negative here. So normally you could just say, well, negative for fungus. It, it could be some form of onychodystrophy or something. But I'll point out here, there's a lot of perikeratosis. And I'll just take you right to the area of interest. And then here, there's not only perikeratosis, but a lot of of neutrophils embedded in here. And let's say the patient had, you know, multiple nail involvement on the hands and the feet. What might you think of now? Like psoriasis in the nails. Psoriasis in the nails. Yeah, very good. Nail psoriasis, right? So a lot, you know, if we don't have the clinical information, um, which fortunately in my current job, I get lots of clinical info on, on basically every case, which is wonderful. But there are times where I may not have a full clinical picture or know if the patient has the clinical appearance uh, or fit to fit with nail psoriasis. Uh, but when I see a lot of neutrophils and parakeratosis in a disorganized nail plate and fungus has been ruled out, because fungus can produce kind of similar features sometimes, it's worth at least raising, hey, you know, in the right setting clinically, this could potentially fit with nail psoriasis. Uh, because sometimes nail psoriasis um, can be hard to recognize, particularly for physicians that don't deal with psoriasis or nail psoriasis very often. So there's times where the you know patients get treated like fungus or or like other things, and and it takes a while to figure out, oh, this is actually an unusual manifestation of psoriasis here. So nail psoriasis, nice example. Okay, case five. I can take this one. So okay. right away, it looks like. The action is in the dermis here. Um, there's a pretty brisk Good. infiltrate. Mm -hmm. And then going in closer. Still hard to make out those cells it's, from here. <laughs> apologies. It's a little slow to load here today. Okay, so small blue cells. And then that looks like some foreign pigment. It's too dark, too clumps um, for anything that the body would make. So that looks like it, it's foreign, likely tattoo. And then surrounding that, Good. it looks like kind of a mixed infiltrate, lymphohistiocytic. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, the little round dots are going to be lymphocytes. And then the cells that have more abundant pink or gray cytoplasm usually that's going to be histiocytes. Even from low power, if you see an infiltrate that's very, very blue, probably lymphocytes um, or other round blue cell things. Um, and if you see some gray and pink areas, then that means probably there's histiocytes in the mixture of infiltrate. Or maybe as you get closer, you could think of other things like tumor cells or something that have extra uh, cytoplasm. But for if it's all inflammatory, yeah, round dots or lymphs, grayish cytoplasm or pink cytoplasm is going to be usually histiocytes. 
And there's probably other stuff, eosinophils, maybe plasma cells in here. But like you picked up, this is not from the human body. And how do we know? It's black. The human body does not make anything that is black. You know, no matter how black a, a nevus looks on the skin surface, microscopically, it's always brown. Melanin pigment is brown. Hemocytorin is golden brownish color. The body can make red, yellow, green, brown. Um, maybe I'm missing something. Those are the main variants, but, but never totally pure black, uh, to my knowledge at least. So um, if you see something that is in tissue that's black, that means almost certainly it came from outside the body. It could be tattoo, could be you know a pencil, like graphite from a pencil injury in the past. If it's in the oral cavity, it could be amalgam or other metals. Metals usually look black microscopically, like people that drink a bunch of colloidal silver for you know some dubious health benefit. They can get argyria and have blue skin that microscopically will have little tiny particles of black. So that's a really useful clue. A lot of people don't know that. I've heard of people saying they don't want to use black ink when they're you know, inking a melanoma specimen because it might get confused. And I was like, no way, man. Melanoma is never going to be black microscopically, always brown. If it has pigment, it'll be brown, but sometimes it doesn't have any pigment. So yeah, this is a tattoo with a huge amount of inflammation. And look, here's different. There's like a, a, a more colors. This is red, right? That's red tattoo pigment. Sometimes on a scan can be a little hard to see. In real life, it can kind of mimic... Um, blood at, at first glance from low power, but when you get closer, it has that like little speckled granularity. And if you look around, sometimes you'll find green and other colors also. I, I find green uh, kind of hard to distinguish from black sometimes microscopically. I think there's different formulations of tattoo uh, pigment. It's not really ink, it's more like pigment from different companies. And um, when you get a tattoo reaction, um, in my experience, most of the time a tattoo reaction looks like this really super brisk lymphohistiocytic infiltrate. Oftentimes I've seen this before with tons of lymphocytes in the epidermis. I mean, if you didn't know, and I just showed you a picture of this, you could think mycosis fungoides, right? T-cell lymphoma, because it's like lymphocytes with little almost potrier microabscesses and tagging along the basal layer. So uh, sometimes the, the tattoo reactions are so brisk that they have a pseudo lymphomatous appearance that they can look kind of like mycosis fungoides or other lymphomas because they're so dense and brisk and robust. Historically, uh, red tattoo ink was the, the, one of the common offenders because it's made from uh, mer mercuric ore called cinnabar. I don't know if it still is or if all of it is, but in any case, I've heard that. Although I have some friends who are tattoo artists, and I asked one of them how often they've seen a tattoo reaction, and they said that they never had. Now, I mean, they've been practicing, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or something. So I, maybe, maybe we see it more often in Dermpath because we see all the times when it happens. I have seen a case once where it was so severe they had to actually excise the whole tattoo because it was so bad and the patient was really miserable and uncomfortable. So, um, I, and by the way, I think tattoos are awesome and I've always wanted one. I still don't have one, but I'd really like to get one one day. So, um, uh, but I have to admit, I'm, I, I wonder if I should get a little test tattoo first to make sure I don't get a, a brisk reaction before I go for that full sleeve, you know, that, I, that I'd love to have. So in any case, um, now you know about my secret desire to have tattoos. And uh, this is, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is a lot of times we think foreign body reactions should be granulomas. But to me, if I see well-formed granulomas in a tattoo, I'm much more likely to think that that actually is sarcoid involving a tattoo because sarcoid sometimes arises at sites of trauma, including like a tattoo trauma. So if I see that, actually, I'm more likely sarcoidal granulomas plus tattoo. I would usually favor that to be a, a patient with sarcoidosis that has involvement of their tattoo uh, kind of from that Kebnerization uh, trauma-induced response rather than like an actual tattoo-based reaction. Of course, you got to put that together with the clinical history and everything. So a nice example of a really brisk, basically pseudo-lymphomatous, in my opinion, uh, Dr. tattoo Gardner, reaction. Quick question on this one. Um, with the PEH yes. and like all this inflammation, my brain kind of went to infectious first. Ah. In practice, would you do bug stains on this or would this kind of be enough for you to just call it like pseudo-lymphomatous? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I, it depends, I guess, on the individual case. If I saw like actual, and when I see well-formed like sarcoid granulomas, I I do the bug stains uh, to rule out AFB or fungus. And in my, to my memory, they have always been negative, but kind of it's like the, you know, the, the rule that you're supposed to do. Here, I feel like it's more of a, 
I, I might do it, but when I've got like obvious tattoo here and clinically they're telling me this is arising in the tattoo, the tattoo is swollen and raised up and inflamed, I feel personally I probably would be comfortable. I think the last time I saw one like this, I don't recall doing uh, bug stains. But I would say that if you ever have a doubt about infection, it's it's almost never the wrong answer to do infectious stains just to be sure if you have any concern, right? So I think usually I do that on a case-by-case -case basis where I put together the clinical with what I'm seeing microscopically and decide. I would say though that this kind of you know enlargement of the hair follicles and kind of glassy appearance is a, is a change that you can see, kind of a reactive change that you can see in the setting of tattoo reactions. I've seen that before. So kind of not surprising given how brisk the infiltrate is, right? So good question. Always good to think of infection though, um, definitely. All right, case uh, six. I can take this one. Okay, anyone? So it looks like we have some okay. hyperkeratosis. And then it looks like Good. there is almost a column that has some dyskeratotic cells at the like kind of basal or granular layer. Yeah. A little dye um, sure. So I guess with that, I'd be thinking of something like a porokeratosis. Very good. That's what this is. This is porokeratosis, and like you said, this is a cornic lamella. It's maybe not the most beautiful example of a, you know, a tier or a stack, a tower of parakeratosis. But one thing that helps me, especially when I, when I'm not, you know, when you have a beautiful example of this perfect leaning tower of parakeratin, um, and I've got some examples in, in videos on my YouTube and Kiko um, pages, um, then no problem, right? But but in subtle cases, it can be hard to tell because lots of things can give you little little piles of paracara. Uh, but I like your point. This I find very helpful that almost always in cor true coronary lamellae, you're going to have a little dip or a little invagination of the epidermis, often not nearly as dramatic as this one. And you're going to have little dying keratinocytes, little bright pink apoptotic uh, individual keratinocytes, and often some little vacuolation of the keratinocytes, little clear vacuoles in the area right under the para. And then it's going to be invaginated a little bit. So that combination of findings with para over top makes me favor a cornic lamella. And here we've got another one here, again, a real weak kind of subtle one, one here. The epidermis also shows a lot of acanthosis. And so what if I told you this was like in the gluteal cleft, you know, like right between the both it, of the, the buttocks. It's a cheeks. certain type. It's the what would you tichotropia. Think? Yeah, exactly. Porokeratosis, tichotropica, tichotropica, however you say it which tends to be this thicker and acanthotic. It often is in like the kind of anogenital area the, or the folded sites of the body. And it tends to have, um, in addition to acanthosis, it tends to have multiple coronary lamellae. Now I've seen other porokeratoses that have multiple lamellae as well. And it, I, to my knowledge, the variant doesn't, I don't know that it makes a huge difference which, which type you say. But in any case, just to know that that is a, a variant of porokeratosis um, that has, is thicker and is in fold sites. And here's another, you know, look at a different cornic lamella right here. There's the, pa the para and there's the little dying keratinocytes and vacuoles. And a lot of times you'll see a lot of unusual changes in the dermis under the poro, particularly like in a regular poro where it's a ring. In the middle of the ring, you'll see fibrosis, interface change, um, uh, lymphocytes, all sorts of stuff. And then when you go out beyond the ring, the dermis turns normal again. I don't know what it is about uh, poros, but they seem to not only have an impact on the epidermis, but they also alter the dermis underneath them as they kind of spread outward. They tend to make a lot of reactive changes, sometimes vascular changes that look almost like stasis. Very strange, very interesting diseases, porokeratosis. We're on um, acral skin. Um, it looks like there's some, some blood um, in the stratum corneum, um, and so it looks like talon noir. Yeah. Noir. Yeah, Talon Noir, black heel. But yeah, you get these very dark black lesion, often on the heel, on your foot, but it can also be in other sites on the palm or sole, or you can have a similar uh, effect in the in the nail plate or under the, you know, from some uh, subungual hematoma from trauma. 
Um, and the key is clinically, they look so dark that they often are very concerning for uh, melanoma or, a, or another melanocytic lesion. But then on biopsy, we see this big pool of blood trapped in the stratum corneum here. And um, interestingly, if you're looking for this, you know, hemocytorin is not going to usually be here. It's usually blood, but hasn't like turned into hemocytorin. Hemocytorin is usually going to happen in the dermis. So it, when I first uh, started out in Dermpath, I thought, oh, maybe a, if I had a subtle case, maybe a uh, Prussian blue iron stain would help me to identify subtle blood in like the nail plate or the stratum corneum. And actually, that's not, not going to help you because the iron will not stain blood, only stains hemocytorin. So I thought that was kind of an interesting pearl that I, I didn't know about early on. So in any case, there you go. That's uh, no stain needed there, right? We got beautiful, perfect example of blood in the stratum corneum, talon noir. All right, I have case several eight. specimens here. Um, looks like there's a lot of acanthosis, papillomatosis. Um, so we want to go a little closer to see what's going on. You can make out from here some coilocytosis as well. Um, so and some rounded perikeratosis. This is good for a condyloma. Yeah, great. This is a good uh, good example uh, from low power. It's papillomatous. It's got acanthosis of the epidermis with papillomatosis. And the papillomatosis, or the, the finger-like projections, instead of being long fingers like a regular Veruca vulgaris, a common wart, uh, um, genital warts, or condyloma cuminatum, uh, tend to have these rounded kind of uh, knuckle-like borders. Now, I will tell you, though, I think I, I'm not totally sure if that's purely because of the different types of HPV or because it's in the anogenital like fold sites where there's kind of, you know, occlusion and rubbing of the lesion. Because I would say that I've seen things in other fold sites like the axilla, like seborrheic keratoses or even Veruca in axilla or other fold sites sometimes get this rounded knuckled appearance. So, but anytime I see that, I want to know, is it anogenital? And if it is, then I want to go and look for some of the other features like ideally coilocytes. I, I personally, I like to see coilocytes good coilocytes to make a definitive diagnosis of condyloma because remember you are labeling someone with a sexually transmitted infection and potentially that can cause you know some um, social issues for the patient so what I like to do is if I find coilocytes then I know there's HPV effect there and I know that this is condyloma if it's an anogenital site okay what do I want to see for coilocytes I got a whole video about Veruca vulgaris and I actually go into coilocytes in that video you can go check that out if you want to know more about warts than you ever wanted to know but you want ideally you will you know most people talk about the vacuoles or pale cytoplasm in the in the um the superficial spinous layer near the granular layer but beyond just having vacuoles lots of keratinocytes have vacuoles look these guys have vacuoles but those are not coilocytes coilocytes not only have vacuoles or kind of pale grayish cytoplasm they have huge nuclei the nuclei are at the top of the epidermis should be getting smaller and starting to flatten out, right? But here we have nuclei that are as big or even bigger than the spinous layer keratinocytes, and they begin to kind of have weird kind of change to the nuclear chromatin. Sometimes you'll see multinucleate, like double nuclei together. And also you'll often find like actual, it's not quite in focus, but big purple granules in these large nuclei with the pale cytoplasm. You'll see they're like all the way up in the granular layer and still have huge nuclei. So to me, that's what I really like. This to me is definitive, 100% coilocyte there. And also the other features you have are features similar to other warts. You'll tend to have parakeratosis, although instead of spires on top of the tips, sometimes you get little bits of para down in these valleys in between the uh, rounded papillomatous areas. Here's more coilocyte right here. So once you have condyloma, um, you need to look around, make sure there's no uh, high-grade dysplasia like HCIL, high, high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, which is kind of a high-grade dysplasia on the spectrum with squamous cell carcinoma in situ. But when it's in the anogenital area and it's driven by HPV, we call that um, HCIL, H-S-I-L. And so always look for that and make sure you're not missing that. Here's more, more coilocytes here. And here's some of that parakeratosis kind of down in the little valleys, okay? And you'll also often see dilated capillaries in the papillary dermis like you see in regular Veruca. So that's condyloma. And, um, oh yeah, I said I like to see coilocytes. Um, it's also if you know that the patient already carries a diagnosis of HPV because of a past PAP or previous condylomas, that also reduces the, the concern maybe about making this diagnosis. 
Um, and then if I have doubt, I, you can, if you have it in your lab, you can use in situ hybridization to look for HPV, um, the 6 and 11 and the other low risk types, although that's not perfect and it's not 100%. So if it's positive, it's very helpful. If it's negative, it still doesn't rule out condyloma. And if I'm unsure, I'll say it's a verrucoid keratosis and that, you know, it has some features of condyloma, but I don't see obvious HPV. And so the differential could include SEB or verruca vulgaris or other things, okay? And then I leave it to be figured out kind of clinically. Uh, based on the patient's history and other things. There's one other thing I wanted to show you here. Once it comes into focus. What's going on here? Here's the condyloma, and then suddenly it looks like, what? See the nuclei that are streaming here? They, suddenly the keratinocytes, which should have round nuclei, have become like super long and spindled, and they're stretching and streaming out. And then the stratum corneum is suddenly all mangled and globbed together. And look, the dermis, the collagen, is suddenly turned very different kind of purpley color and is very smudgy. This is cautery artifact. Electrocautery uh, produces this. <clears throat> Any sort of, you know, electrosurgery, electrocautery, electrical current uh, at high strength flowing through tissue produces this. Um, from electrical shock or a lightning strike even or things like that will cause a very similar appearance. So um, that is, that's a good example of cautery artifact. And in pathology, we see this all the time. But in, in uh, dermatology trained, uh, in dermatology training, you may not encounter this very often because uh, most of the dermatologists I worked with do not remove skin specimens with, with electrosurgery or electrocautery. So don't, you know, we don't often see that in specimens sent from dermatologists. In fact, in the practice settings I've been in, when I see cautery, I know almost certainly that this was taken off by a surgeon or somebody non-dermatologist just because of differences in practice style. Um, it's not wrong to remove something with cautery, but I will tell you, once it gets cauterized, I cannot tell what's happening there. So if you want me to give you margins and stuff, if I have tumor cells going into a cauterized area, I'm going to call the margin positive because I cannot reliably see what's actually happening at the ink. So if you're watching this and you're someone who uses cautery and, you know, just know that that's one downside that your, your margin, you're going to lose this little strip here because if I have tumors going, tumor cells going into that, and this is obviously not a tumor case, but if I had a cancer case with cautery at the edge, I, if it goes into cautery, I usually will call the margin positive. So just FYI, that's, that's the way I do it at least. So condyloma plus cautery artifact. Case nine. And this one is pretty hard to see, so I'm just going to tell you. You got a biopsy like on the cheek. And down here in the derm is very subtle. We see scattered brown pigmented spindle cells, very sparse. And they're not just up here, like where we'd see melanin pigment incontinence, like in someone who has post inflammatory pigment alteration, but they're going down a lot deeper than that. Even like down here, look, there's still little spindly pigmented cells. So what might this be? Like a neva. Uh, uh, on the face, it would be ODA, dermal melanocytosis. Very good. Dermal melanocytosis is a nice category to put this in. It encompasses nevus of ODA on the face, nevus of EDA, which is usually like the shoulder region, and also the, the entity, I guess, formerly known as Mongolian spot on the lower back of babies um, in patients of, of uh, certain types of ancestry. And uh, the with a usually with a kind of darker skin type. So in any case, all of those will show similar findings, which are going to be scattered, pigmented, spindled melanocytes scattered in the dermis. Okay. So blue nevus is a little bit like this, but usually much more of them. Even a hypocellular little blue nevus should have more cells than this. Usually with dense collagen and usually kind of in a nice little wedge shape, not this kind of scattered, um, spread out appearance. You could also think, looking at this slide with no history, you could also wonder, uh, could this be hemosiderin from like previous, you know, trauma or an ecchymosis, a bruise that's resolving? And, and usually hemosiderin looks a little more golden, but it can be sometimes very hard to tell them apart reliably without stains. And so you could do Fontana Masson to stain the melanin, or you could do an iron stain to highlight hemosiderin, or you could think of maybe drug pigment deposition, like minocycline um, can look kind of like this, and, and other drug pigments, scattered pigment in the dermis. So if these sometimes, um, because they're pretty subtle, they sometimes require stains um, to sort them out if it's unclear clinically. Um, but those are, that's just kind of a, 
uh, an example of when I see little scattered pigment in the dermis, that's the kind of differential that runs through my mind. Hemosiderin, or are they melanocytes with melanin, or is it a drug pigment which can stain sometimes with either of those, Fontana or, or iron stain, or both, depending on the type of drug pigment and the setting. And that's outside the scope of, of this lecture. But this was a nevus of ODA, and I do not see these biopsy very often. So this is something I don't encounter very often in practice, actually. Dermal melanocytosis. Case 10, we've got a shave here. What, what's going on here? Yeah, I can take this one. So it looks like the very superficial epidermis is pink. It's dead, okay. necrotic. Um, and then I think there is some serious fluid kind of coming in between that space there. Um, it makes me think, so this is good something acute that happened, and I think it's probably something external, um, just given that the lower, the deeper epidermis looks entirely good. untouched from that process. Yeah, so this something killed the epidermis here and it lifted off. And actually, this, this epidermis is actually new. This has regrown since. Um, just from knowing how these things work, that's how I can know. And also, it looks a little bit more um, uh, kind of the, the keratinocytes get a little bit big and glassy and almost a little atypical because they're regenerating and reactive and growing. And they kind of stream and stretch across. So what this tells me is this is the either a blister that has lifted off and the roof died and then re-epithelialized, or it is, like you said, sudden death of the epidermis that then detached, and then the epidermis regrew and healed underneath. And in that ca this case, the clinical history is going to be important to tell that apart. But you can actually see, like you said, you can look at the ghost outline of keratinocytes. It's a little bit hard to see here, but this is like you can even see the reedy ridges here. The whole epidermis died. You can see the little ghost outline of dead keratinocytes, totally pink. Their nuclei are gone. But even the keratin layer is like nice, normal basket weave ortho, which tells you that this happened like instantly, right? Or overnight. The epidermis didn't have any time to respond or react. It just died right away. And so uh, several things can cause that. Uh, burn, which is what this is. This was actually a curling iron burn. I'm not sure why I got biopsy. This is, a, is again, from a study set, so I don't know the history. Uh, freeze artifact from cryo. To me, in my opinion, cryo and, and burn, thermal, uh, look essentially identical, okay? They look like wiped out um, zone of, of death in the epidermis. It depends, I guess, on how much freeze and how much burn, but I think of them as like thermal injury. Either too much heat or too little heat can cause this, this appearance. And here's some more over here. The other important thing to think of, and like I said, some blistering diseases, um, when the blister has been present long enough, the roof can die, and then you can re-epithelialize, so the, the history becomes important there. And then acute ischemia can cause sudden death of the epidermis, but usually in that, a lot of times acute ischemia things are very urgent and, and serious uh, diseases, and they don't often just like suddenly happen once and then then the epidermis regrows. They, they're going to have other situation, other problems underneath, like thrombi in the vessels or the patient's really sick. But, uh, you know, but when you do see death in a zonal necrosis of the epidermis, always keep acute ischemia in mind, especially if there's no regeneration of epidermis underneath and, and it's something that just happened. Um, that's an important thing to exclude. So this is, this is a burn injury, but again, those are the differentials I think of when I see a zonal kind of sudden necrosis of the epidermis. Case 11, I always enjoy when I, when I see these, a rare treat, if you're, if you're weird like me and it's a tick. unusual derm path stuff. All right, what is this? A tick. Yeah, it's a tick. This is uh, not human right here, right? This is an arthropod. And we can tell because look at this this thick layer of yellow stuff. That's chitin, right? Which is kind of like a carbohydrate, I believe, that is in a lot of arthropod um, um, uh, exoskeletons. And in fact, you can even look into the body of the tick and look. That's a little tick skeletal muscle. You can see the peripheral nuclei. Sometimes you can even see, oh, right there. Look, you can see the striations. Isn't that wild? It's like a world within a world, right? It's like here we're studying human microanatomy, and then all of a sudden there's a 
uh, an intruder from non-human origin and you can look at its internal structure. Now, I don't know much beyond, I can recognize skeletal muscle, but I am not um, an entomologist and I do not know all the other parts of the tick. Look at the skeletal muscle. That always blows my mind still. I just think it's crazy. It's so wild. But um, yeah, so how do we know it's a tick? Well, mainly the size and the position, right? It's an arthropod that it was hooked onto the skin surface so much that it came off with the shave. It's way too big to be a scabies mite. Scabies would be like about, you know, a little smaller than this. Scabies would be like about that size, right? So tick is way bigger. Tunga penetrans, tungiasis, which is a flea that burrows into the foot, could look like this, but it's not going to usually be hanging off the surface. It's going to be embedded right underneath within the epidermis and covered over by stratum corneum. And it's going to be like five or 10 times bigger than this. And it's going to be on acral skin. So that's basically how we know it's a tick. And the only other real mimic here would be, oh yeah, bot fly, which could look a little bit like this, but it's going to be down in the dermis. And then sometimes I've seen arthropods that accidentally, like bugs that accidentally got into like the surface of like a purulent, you know, exudated tumor or got somehow trapped in the block during processing. Rare, but I've seen that occasionally where they are not actually, they're just totally incidental and not from the patient. But yeah, this is a tick and here is the, the tick bite reaction. We've got a little puncture of the epidermis and neutrophils here and see how the dermis gets kind of, it starts getting smudgy and homogenized, particularly you know, bug bites in general are, excuse me, arthropod bite reactions have similar features, you know, superficial and deep perivascular with eosinophils, sometimes with the little punk, uh, puncture site at the top. But uh, tick bites in particular tend to get this smudgy and sometimes like pink homogenized material that um, is, I can't remember the explanation, but it's something to do with the, the tick makes a secretion as it bites, I believe, and then that's, that secretion builds up around it and or alters the dermis. I can't remember. It, there's a more elegant explanation for that, but it does. When I see what looks like an arthropod bite reaction with smudgy pink stuff in the middle, sometimes I'll cut deeper in hopes of finding a piece of tick mouth part. So let me show you another example here. This is a really, like the best one I've ever seen, an intact tick that was came off right with the um, the epidermis and dermis and was perfectly sectioned. That's the best one I'm, I'm ever going to see probably. And uh, this is what we usually see is this this little piece of mouth part embedded in the dermis. I think these are the two little, you know, tubes that it, it like it's fangs basically. And I, I'm sorry if you're an entomologist watching this, I know there are are uh, lots of uh, technical words for these things, but again, I don't know them. Again, note the yellow chitin, okay? But these are this is the mouth part, and sometimes we'll find fragments of this embedded in the dermis, and here's that pink kind of hyalinized, smudgy, glassy stuff I was talking about that we often see around tick mouth parts. So sometimes I'll do deepers to see if we find any retained mouth part there. Um, uh, so that's a nice example. Okay. Case 12. So this one looks like kind of an infiltrate in the dermis here mainly. Um, and it's kind of those like gray cytoplasm like we were talking about. So like histiocytes mainly. So some, some lymphs in there it looks like as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Sure. Yes. And also um, some of these. Let's see if any of them are going into the epidermis. Yeah. There so, um, LCH. Good. So hand you hand right hand away, hand I can tell that you know what this is. So what is it? So, um, LCH. Yeah, this is Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and it is a papillary dermal infiltrate of mononuclear cells that look a lot like histiocytes, often with some eosinophils, and it tends to trickle into the epidermis. The other thing that likes to an infiltrate that fills the papillary dermis is mastocytosis, mast cell diseases, urticaria pigmentosa or mastocytoma. They often fill the papillary dermis, but they respect the boundary of the basement membrane and do not enter the epidermis. But remember, Langerhans cells, I don't know what molecule on their surface gives them the ability to do it, but they can easily cross over the basement membrane because they normally, normal Langerhans cells live in the mid spinous layer, right? And then they get an antigen and then they go down to the dermis and go to the lymph nodes and, and do their immune system role, right? Their antigen presenting role. So unfortunately, in this case, we can't really see the classic um, uh, features. You can get a little idea of a bean-shaped nucleus there, but let me show you uh, some uh, different ones. So we'll come back to that in a minute here. So this is one where it's filling the papillary dermis and then floridly spreading into the epidermis. In fact, 
occasionally, if you're having a bad day, you can see just an area like this and think of like pagetoid melanocytes. And guess what? These stay with S100 just like melanocytes, which is why I do not use S100 when I'm looking at epidermal involvement by a melanocytic thing. I use SOX10 or you can use MART1, but S100 is tricky because it'll stain Langerhan cells. So this is another example of Langerhans histiocytosis. Here's one where you can see the bean shape of the Langerhans cells more clearly. And then here's a close-up from a different case where you can see that they have, sometimes they look like bean shapes, sometimes they look, here's like a little bean shaped one. Other times that, that um, shows up as a little groove or a line, kind of like a coffee bean shape. So sometimes they're kind of horseshoe or kidney shaped, other times they look kind of coffee bean shaped. It depends on kind of the angle of sectioning. See the little lines, the little deep grooves down, down the, the length of them? Those are nice example of Langerhans cells. And also do remember there's another thing, uh, it's kind of a rare bird called indeterminate cell histiocytosis or indeterminate dendritic cell tumor, I believe is the other name. And it looks uh, just like um, Langerhans and stains similarly in the fact that it stains with CD1A, which is the marker that stains Langerhans cells, but it's negative for uh, CD207, which is called Langerin. So when I see LCH, if it fits classically and it's a kid, I usually just do the CD1A and then say it's um, uh, Langerhans histiocytosis. But if I see something that looks like LCH and it's an adult and it's like a solitary lesion, then usually what I'll do is I'll get Langerin, uh, send out for Langerin and make sure that it's not indeterminate dendritic cell tumor, which is kind of a much rarer and, and, and still somewhat poorly understood disease to my knowledge. I mean, it's more in the realm of heme paths, so I'm not an expert, but I've seen a few cases now, and it looks otherwise to me just like uh, Langerhans histiocytosis. The only way I know to tell it apart is to well, either do electron microscopy to show that it doesn't have beer back granules or to do CD207 uh, Langerin. Okay. So a little bit of acanthosis and papillomatosis okay. here, some sebaceous glands. Um, looking into the dermis, it looks like there's some smooth muscle maybe from this power. Yeah, lots of smooth muscle. Um, so this is yeah. um, good for an accessory. Definitely, nipple. lots of smooth muscle. More than normal, right? Yeah, and then even more, there's a bonus. This, which you could think looks a little bit like an eccrine duct, but it's kind of like the cells are smaller and, and kind of a more cellular. A layer. They, I don't know exactly how to describe it. They look a little different. The cells are smaller, more in number. They often have a little kind of tufting. This is a lactiferous ductule, basically a nipple duct is what that looks like. Um, and so it, the best thing is when you find that, but even when you don't have that, if it's a little brown papule and it's in the milk line, right, that line between the nipple down to the, the pubic bone, um, and you see a little brown papule there and on biopsy it shows it kind of epidermal changes, maybe a sebaceous gland, increased smooth muscle. If you're lucky, uh, a nipple duct, then that is a supernumerary or accessory uh, nipple. And that's a good example of one. And see, sometimes it'll just be like this, smooth muscle plus that epidermal kind of hyperplasia. Okay, great. Case 14. Okay, what's going on here? Acantholysis, which seems to be preferentially above the basal layer. Yeah, good. It's a little harder to tell in this follicle, but the epidermis is falling apart. And you can tell it's due to acantholysis because of two things. Number one, you have rounded up kind of darker pink keratinocytes that are rounded up. It's because they're kind of piling uh, their, their cytoplasm is not stretched out. It's kind of balled up. So they look a little darker and denser than, than the stretched out normal keratinocytes. So when you have uh, white space plus rounding up keratinocytes that are free floating, that's acantholysis, right? And here you can see that also that the basal layer is still intact and it's kind of got that rounded bulging uh, surface, the, the so-called uh, tombstone pattern, right? And that rounding is also because not only has the, the keratinocyte lost contact with its uh, keratinocytes above it, but also it's kind of lost the side contact with its neighboring basal keratinocytes, but its hemidesmosomes are still intact but the desmosomes are all dysfunctional. So that's acanthalysis with the basal layer intact and hair follicles involved. So what is this? 
Yeah, this is classic Pemphigus vulgaris. In real life practice, sometimes it's it's actually a little harder to tell Pemphigus vulgaris versus Pemphigus foliaceus just on the path. I mean, usually we teach that the foliaceous, the split is higher and vulgaris it's lower. And the same thing with the immunodeposits, the net like IgG and C3 around keratinocytes. But in practice, it is not always totally clear cut. So I've had cases before where I've signed out as Pemphigus family and then it needs to be further worked up clinically to, to sort out which one it is. Oftentimes, clinically, they're going to be um, distinguished by the fact that vulgaris has oral involvement and foliaceous doesn't, and by the distribution and appearance, right? But, but um, uh, on PATH, uh, it's not always 100% clear cut, but that's good. And of course, there are other acantholytic diseases uh, to keep in the differential, but that's kind of outside uh, what we have time for in this video. But a very good example of, of dramatic acantholysis down the follicle, and often you have lots of dermal inflammation um, associated with pemphigus uh, vulgaris. All right. Low power. Yeah, I can take this one again. Um, seems power. like a pigmented <laughs> lesion stay. So this looks like some pigment in the dermis here. It looks brown. I'm favoring this is internal, something that the body made itself, and it looks pretty fine. So favoring melanin on this. And then Good. it looks like, um, Good. I think there are some melanocytes scattered in and around near Well, I'll tell you, let's say we weren't sure and we did a, a MART1 or a SOX10 stain and yeah, it's negative. That, All these cells are negative. That, I think would bring up and the question the background of regression. Cells are negative. What would you do yeah, then? Good. And what do we call when we have a melanocytic lesion that regresses yeah, and leaves two a big, melanosis. big blob of pigment behind, melanin pigment in the dermis? There's a fancier word for it. What is that? Tumoral melanosis, good. This is a nice example of tumoral melanosis, which is what happens when melanocytic lesions regress, oftentimes melanomas, although technically it could happen in other things too. And I can't classify whether this is melanoma or not based on what I have here, right? Because I don't see any melanocytes. The dark cells, like I mentioned before, but if you're a beginner watching this, uh, a cell with abundant melanin in it usually is not a melanocyte, with some exceptions, okay? There are exceptions, but if it's in the epidermis and has a lot of melanin, usually it's a keratinocyte, not a melanocyte. In the dermis, a lot of melanin, it usually is a melanophage, a macrophage or histiocyte that's eaten up a bunch of melanin that's dropped out there. But again, there are times where melanoma and, and nevi have really heavy pigments, so, um, but that's outside the scope. So not only do we have a, abundant, so you know, one thing I'll bring up is that occasionally it's hard to, you can wonder, well, how do I know if it's tumoral melanosis from regression versus melanin pigment incontinence from, you know, previous inflammation that's dropped out? Usually pigment incontinence is going to be sparse and scattered, not in big nodules. So there have been occasional times where I've struggled to tell, but usually it's pretty, pretty obvious to me the difference. And if I'm not sure, then I'll mention in my report, there's melanin and I'm not, I think it's probably, you know, pigment incontinence from previous inflammation, but it's a little more dense than usual. And, and based on the clinical, then we can try to piece together if it could be a regressible anesthetic thing. A couple of clues here that help in addition to the density of this. Other things, look here. This is, this is kind of fibrosis, right? This is a lot more fibrosis, kind of, kind of scar-like or even disorganized a little bit that's replacing the papillary dermis. And this is new collagen because look, this patient has sun damage. See their solar elastosis? And that solar elastosis has been pushed down and replaced by collagen that's new without any elastosis. That tells me this happened after the person got older and sun damage. Not, this is not the collagen they were born with. This is new. So it's either scar from a biopsy or scar from fibrosis from regression or something else, right? So that's a nice trick when you see elastosis down below and pink collagen up above, that means it's new collagen. You gotta figure out why it's there, put together with the history. Another thing, if you do MART1 or SOX10, not always, but a lot of times you'll find that the normal scattered, normal basal layer melanocytes that are normally seen in the epidermis will have zones where they're wiped out and gone, uh, either big zones or, or partial areas where they're gone um, in cases where you've had complete regression of a melanocytic lesion because not only did the melanoma or whatever the lesion was there get taken out, but also the epidermal component did. 
So that's uh, sometimes, you know, I've had patients where they had metastatic melanoma with no known primary. They got a full dermatologic exam and they found one dark spot somewhere in their body. They biopsied it and this is what we found. And in those cases, theoretically, what happened was the melanoma was there. Once it metastasized, I think, my, my theory is that it kind of activates the immune system on overdrive once it gets to the lymph node, and then that comes back and wipes out and destroys the original melanoma. So I've seen patients with huge, bulky metastases, and it all came from a little original pro probable primary lesion. I mean, we never can totally prove what happens. But in any case, that, those are helpful features. If you see loss of the normal melanocytes, if you see fibrosis um, and the density of the melanin, that's tumoral melanosis. And it's not a bad idea in these cases to get a stain to see if there are any melanocytes hiding in there um, that could help give you more clues to if this was definitely a melanoma or not. In this patient with sun damage and regression fibrosis around it, I mean, most likely this was melanoma. Case 16. So there's What's an empty space there's there, and there's space. also a little bit of like fibromyxin uh, stroma surrounding it, really? it. Uh, and maybe some residual little basaloid cells there. Yeah. So you think that maybe a basal fell out? Good. Yeah, this is a basal cell that has popped out and detached because it you know has that cleft with mucin around it. Um, and sometimes during processing, most or even rarely all of the basal can pop out. I would say the majority of times when this happens, I will find, it, especially if I do some deeper levels, I'll find little fragments of basal cells still clinging in there. Or look over here, that's actually probably basal. If you just had this, you could wonder maybe is it a proliferative AK, actinic keratosis or something. But putting all of it together, the key, like you said, is the stroma. This pink and blue chondromyxoidy looking stroma with mixed inflammation. This is not normal dermis, right? The, the normal dermis is that pink stuff down here. This is new, kind of, kind of bluish, pale. That stroma is important to recognize in derm path because if you see it, and if you even don't see it, if I just see this and nothing else, I'll cut deeper because I bet we're about to cut into a basal cell. And if I have cases where I'm pretty sure a basal has popped out of this space and I can't find any basal, I'll actually say, well, there's stroma here. And based on that, I think this is a basal that has just detached during uh, processing and that it should be treated like a basal clinically. Again, it's pretty uncommon that I actually have to do that. Most of the time I'll find a little basal, but that's, a, that's an artifact that happens sometimes and it's good to know. 17. Looking thing, and yeah, this is, this is I think, ultimately what helped me because when I looked at the other, other um, little cut up top, I, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it, but um, with the... You know, I thought maybe it's like, is that a really, really bizarre, funky duct in there? But I think that's just a big um, necrotic uh, clump of tumoral cells. And so, yeah, what we call that a comedo necrosis pattern, kind of similar to in breast cancer. Some breast cancers have this where it's like a big island of tumor yeah, so and then this carcinoma big is one that I think central of zone with of it. necrosis. And it looks like there's you can maybe see that like in a variety of cancers like epidermal in involvement too. on as well with sebaceous. Yeah, right. We good, good eye. We've got these nodules here that it's hard to say. I think they're probably invasive, although you could make an argument that it's tumor spreading down in a nexal structure and expanding it. But I think it's pretty concerning for invasion, honestly. And then up here we have carcinoma in situ with a lot of pale cytoplasm. So the struggle here is always determining, is this is cancer for sure. How do we know what kind it is? Could this be squamous in situ? Bowen's disease? Absolutely. Squamous in situ and Bowen's can look like this and get vacuolated um, pale cytoplasmic cells. So it can be really vexing in practice. So you could also even think, uh, if you just had this, you could think at first maybe it's a weird basal cell. But it doesn't have great palisading, and it's pretty ugly. And here, the key also that helps us is where we are in the body. Look at that skeletal muscle. So we're on the face somewhere, but in this case, there's a lot of skeletal muscle. We're actually on the eyelid. So anywhere near the eye, if you have an ugly carcinoma in the skin near the eyelid, always think of sebaceous carcinoma. If you have a tumor that looks like an ugly squame that's kind of basaloid or an ugly basal that's kind of squamoid, I always think about the, poss the third possibility not of, of sebaceous carcinoma because I find they often kind of have overlap between basal cell carcinoma and squamous carcinoma 
um, uh, features. But uh, the key is finding evacuated cells that you think are true sebacytes. So that's the problem with sebaceous things is either they're obviously sebaceous, but you struggle to know if they're benign or malignant, um, like sebaceous adenoma versus sebaceous carcinoma, or they're obviously cancer, but you struggle to know if they're truly sebaceous or not. And this is a vexing problem. I've even published several papers about or a couple papers about sebaceous tumors. Um, and I still struggle with this in practice. And there's times where I say I'm not sure. But I've got multiple videos on my channel about sebaceous tumors. You can go check out if you want some other tips. We don't have enough time to go into it, but I will show you. Here's the stain. And unfortunately, I feel like this one didn't, didn't quite scan uh, and show the classic features. But if it comes here, we will. Oh, there it is. There are a variety of stains you can try, none of which are perfect, and that's why there are multiple stains that people keep trying to discover for sebaceous carcinomas. We published a paper showing that you can have nuclear expression of a factor 13A, nuclear staining, excuse me, but it only works with the AC1A1 clone, so we were, the, I think, the first people to publish the evidence of that, and it worked really well in our study, but as I've continued to use it in practice over the years, I've found times where it was still hard to interpret. This stain right here is a dipophilin, which the goal is not just that it's positive, but that you get little uh, vacuoles, little bubbles that are highlighted by the adipophilin. And let me see, I, I looked around yesterday to try to find a good area, but I actually struggled to find one that showed up really well in the scan. Let me see if I can find it again. Ah, you can see a little bit here. It's Again, it's not perfect. This is not the best example, but the, there are little bubbles and vacuoles in the cell that are 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 outlined by brown stain from the adipophilin. So I find that to be a helpful feature to support sebaceous carcinoma. But there are certainly times where I have to say invasive carcinoma, and I'm not totally sure if it's squame or, or maybe an ugly basal or if it's sebaceous. So you can try different stains. Androgen receptor is another stain that, that often stains this, but none of them are totally perfect, I, I feel like. So, so it can be problematic. All right. So the, this was called uh, sebaceous carcinoma in the study set. And on the eyelid, it is particularly important because they do tend to have pagetoids spread back into the conjunctiva. So the, um, the uh, eye surgeons will sometimes approach these differently than they might say a squamous cell carcinoma. 19. So this one I thought 18. looked like um, sort of large geometric infiltrates of uh, sort of pay gray cytoplasm um, like uh, granulomatous structures, not too inflamed, so probably more along the naked gran granuloma type um, type situation. Uh, the yeah. long ones that are over on the right sort of made me think initially, like maybe like a tuberculoid lepasy type picture. Could also consider sarcoid, um, but yeah, sort of granulomatous naked granuloma structures. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's your main differential. Like you said, it's granulomatous dermatitis, and they're very tight, very closely packed together, and they have relatively a little bit of lymphs, but in general, most of them are naked or, let's say, you know, scantily clad granulomas. I don't know if that's been coined yet, but I'm going to coin it um, today, right here in this video. Okay, we've got proof now. So um, they do not have usually very much inflammation. They do not usually have necrosis or neutrophils in them. They may have a variable amount of lymphocytes, but it's not usually a ton and they're packed close together. When you see those granulomas, the main differential is sarcoidosis, like you said, or sometimes foreign body granulomas can look sarcoidal. Um, uh, they usually have multinucleated cells more prominent and some other stuff, and you'll find polarizable material. And then um, tuberculoid leprosy. And here, look, what's this in the middle? It's a nerve. Now, this is in the study set as sarcoid, and it's important to point out in real life, if I see Granulomas like this that are linear or around the nerve, absolutely I'm going to do stains. And in fact, if there's any doubt clinically, even if the stains are negative, I will oftentimes send it for PCR if there's concern um, to more fully try to exclude the possibility of leprosy. It probably depends a lot on where you live in the world. Where we are, it's very rare to find leprosy cases, so our pretest probability is very, very low. But still, if there's any doubt, we want to work it up. I know some people in other parts of the world have told me, you know, even finding granulomatous stuff around 
adnexa and inflammation, they're like, that's, we'll just go ahead and treat it like leprosy because it's so common in their country. So I thought I found that online very interesting to talk to people from different parts of the world and who handle cases like this very differently based on whether leprosy is really common or rare in their country. What we do know though is that sarcoid can wrap around nerves. It can cause paresthesia like leprosy. So it can actually clinically and pathologically mimic leprosy. And these, unfortunately, these cases, the tuberculoid form often have really well-formed granulomas because they have good cell-mediated immunity and thus they have very few organisms. So it's sometimes very hard to find organisms in those cases. So the PCR sometimes you have to resort to and occasionally uh, everything is negative in the end you have to decide how to treat it and, and if it's if we've done everything to rule out infection I've uh, talked to people at like the Hansen's Disease Research Center in Louisiana and one of them told me well in those cases we recommend people treat with immune suppressing drugs like they would treat sarcoid and watch the patient closely and if they get better, it was probably sarcoid. If they get worse, probably leprosy, biopsy it again. So obviously that's kind of scary situation, but I've seen that come up multiple times in my practice. All right. And I've got some videos about leprosy if you want to see some other examples of, of actual leprosy, but this was called sarcoidosis after workup. This is good for like a radiation dermatitis. Yeah, there are a handful of things you could think of here. Uh, really, really severe lichen sclerosis um, would be a great uh, thought because it can have uh, not only hyaluronic sclerotic collagen, but also you can get band of edema underneath and atrophy of the epidermis. Um, this would be awfully thick for lichen sclerosis, but it's certainly a thought. Um, in this case, though, like you said, this is great to me for radiation dermatitis. Not always do you get this at radiated sites. Sometimes show very minimal change or very subtle changes. Other times you see really severe change. I imagine it has to do with the dose and also probably some degree of like the anatomic site or, or the quality of the skin otherwise. But I don't, I have not always pieced together how to detect when people will get this severe change versus when, when they don't have changes. But you see sclerotic collagen replacing much of the dermis. And some features that I really like and find particularly helpful for radiation is this. This is collagen down here, but this is fibrin right here. You often get a lot of leaky dilated blood vessels that are leaking out and make a, this band of kind of fibrin around vessels and in the papillary dermis and edema um, because radiation kind of scars down the skin, which blocks the lymphatics. So you get, you get some lymphedema-like changes in addition to the scarring in the setting of radiation oftentimes, okay? So that fibrin here with the big dilated vessels with the sclerotic collagen. And again, look, we know it's sclerotic not only because it's dense, we know this is new collagen because look, they have elastosis and what's this doing? It's pushing the elastosis out of the way. This is new collagen that has been altered since they got older. And then the other thing is that sometimes you'll see scattered big pleomorphic spindle cells not cellular, just scattered about, kind of speckled in the dermis. And those can look pretty scary, but they are radiation fibroblasts. They are benign reactive cells. And the key to telling them apart from malignancy is that they're scattered and sparse, okay? If you start seeing increased cellularity, then you have to get concerned about recurrent tumor for whatever they had radiated before, um, like if it was a spindled squame or something, or maybe a secondary post-radiation sarcoma. But when they're just scattered and sparse in a background of radiation change, um, then that's going to be just reactive radiation fibroblasts. And of course, in this setting, always look closely at the vessels to make sure you don't have any features of angiosarcoma, which is a tumor that tends to arise in the post-radiation setting. It's a very dramatic and very classic example of radiation dermatitis. And sometimes also you'll see this same hyalinization in the subcutaneous septa. Uh, this one you see it a little bit, but you can see actual lobules of fat wrapped. Occasionally nerves will show this change. It depends on where it is and how much radiation was given. Oh, very good. And I, in fact, I'm going to not edit that out because that's a perfect thing to remember is that blue nevi have a lot of overlapping features with dermatofibroma. Okay. They love to trap collagen at the edges and particularly the hypopigmented form of blue nevus looks very much like dermatofibroma. The biggest difference is um, the dermatofibromas usually have epidermal change and blue nevi don't. And also the pigment is different, right? In dermatofibromas usually have hemosiderin pigment and blue nevi and cellular blue nevi have melanin pigment. But it's good to remember that you can get the trapping of collagen. That's a common feature in blue nevi. Here we are um, uh, hindered by the fact that we just have a chunk of this. I suspect, I don't know this case, 
but I suspect what happened is someone shaved the top of this and then saw black at the bottom of the shave and then went back and, and cut that part out. I've seen that happen many times for, for deep penetrating nevi and cellular blue, which have pigment down deep, where a shave, they thought it would get under, and then they're like, ooh, wow, there's something way deeper. Let's go and get that out. So I imagine that may have been what happened here. And then here's the area that looks uh, much more cellular. The stuff on the other side was kind of closer to regular blue nevus. Here we have kind of packets of round or spindled cells, depends which way you cut them. But even though very cellular and scary looking, if you if we don't have a good view of the cytology here, if you look at them closely, they'll be very uniform and bland. They usually have small or are very inconspicuous nucleoli rather than big, huge ones. And mitotic activity it can be present, but usually is on the low side. And if you have doubts, you can send for molecular testing or other things. Um, I find one of the most helpful things for cellular blue is that when you have a normal biopsy, go up in the superficial dermis and look out at the periphery, and you'll usually find areas of classic blue nevus at the edge. And this big cellular stuff in the middle looks scary, but finding the classic blue at the edge at least tells you you're dealing with something in the blue nevus spectrum. Uh, there are, of course, rare cases of, of blue nevus-like melanoma or melanoma arising from blue nevus. I like to say those words instead of malignant blue nevus because I think that's way more confusing. Uh, but those are very, very rare, but they do happen. So if you have one that has really atypical features, definitely consider getting additional workup or consultation on those uh, very rare entities. But this is a cellular blue nevus, just a funny view of one. And I have a video about cellular blue nevus on my channel. Well, guys, I, I know I've gone over, so I'm going to just uh, skip through these next ones pretty quickly and just tell you what the answers are so that you can have the learning and I don't make you late to clinic. This is a big scar with a bunch of pigment in it, and a lot of it is probably hemocytorin, but some is like really weird color, and at closer look, there are these angulated fragments of stuff that don't look like human body. So this is some form of foreign body, and from the history, and we don't say what, but it was actually uh, some ferruginous or iron-based uh, foreign material, like a piece of metal that got embedded in here. And so probably a lot of this dark color is actually kind of metal iron deposit in the tissue from the foreign body, in addition to the scar and foreign body uh, reaction and the, the hemocytorin from blood. And here's a sign right away from low power. Look, it's, it's what I call, I've coined this, and I think I'm, I've trademarked it in, in, unless Marvel comes after me or whatever, but I think they call this the Wolverine sign. It's like Wolverine took his adamantium claws and sliced right through the tissue. This is a good evidence that there's something hard in the tissue, whether it's chunks of hard foreign material or bits of bone or calcification, something that has caught on the histotechnologist's blade and, and either dulled the blade and made little nicks in it or drug across the tissue and it's left this sheared slices through the tissue. Usually when you see that and see it there, that means that there's something hard in there. Go and find what the hard stuff is and always keep foreign body in mind. And you know, we always teach foreign body with granulomas, but they don't always have to have big granulomas. Sometimes they can be very scarred down like this. All right, the next case, uh, 22. And this is a relatively rare entity, but unfortunately the scan doesn't show it very well, which is un unfortunate. But here, let's say we have a, a, a plaque, a single plaque on the lower leg of an adult. And then on biopsy, mm -hmm. we see tons of lymphocytes in the epidermis. You just stain, these are lymphocytes, okay, T lymphocytes. And they're making little clusters that look like Pottrier microabscesses. So basically, microscopically, this looks like a florid case of mycosis fungoides. But clinically, it's kind of weird in that it's a solitary patch or plaque on the extremity, right? So this is called pagetoid reticulosis, which is kind of a, a variation of mycosis fungoides, I believe is how people still clinically consider it. Uh, my understanding is that it's usually very indolent, even though it looks very florid microscopically. And, um, and uh, the, there are some other things that can have florid epidermotropism like this. And so you do have to exclude those based on additional workup, both clinically and maybe uh, uh, immunohistochemically. But we don't have time to go into that. But just know when you see lymphocytes with florid epidermotropism, like way more than usual MF, and it's a solitary lesion, that's uh, patchoid reticulosis. The other, one of the other names for that is Warringer Collop disease, I believe, is uh, the, if you're into the old-timey um, eponyms, that's, that's one of them. So here we go. And of course, we always have to correlate with any of these things that look like MF. We always have to make sure it makes sense with the clinical because there are mimics. This is a great example of normal eyelid um, anatomy, which is really, you don't get to see very often. This big, long, 
crazy long uh, sebaceous gland is meibomian gland. These little apocrine glands here are the glands of moll, M-O-L-L. -L. This is just the nevus, uh, congenital pattern nevus. I'm not sure why a full excision was done. Maybe it was like obstructing their field of view or something. This is the skin side. Here's the skeletal muscle of the lid. And then here is the conjunctiva, which looks kind of like epidermis, except it doesn't have a granular layer of stratum corneum. And it has these big blue goblet cells in it, these little mucin-filled cells that are in there. So that is a, a nice example of normal eyelid um, microscopic anatomy histology. Big, fluffy cotton candy or pink, pinkish blue clouds in the dermis surrounded by granuloma and giant cells is gout, right? Slam dunk gout. And I have a full, uh, a full video of gout. And there's the there's the needle shaped crystals of gout, which you'll see if you take a touch prep smear, and um, and uh, make it without um, without uh, fixing it. Once we put it through the normal fixation in H and E, um, it disappears. So usually, if you polarize this, you won't see the crystals. And this kind of Swiss cheese looking stuff, you could think of fat necrosis, but they're really large uh, vacuoles. And in the background, very prominent uh, giant cells, foreign body giant cells. And if you're lucky, you will see, it's hard to see on a scan, but in some of these spaces, unlike, you could think of fat necrosis here for sure, but this is like fat necrosis on overdrive. And if you go look in some of the spaces, you will find a little clear refractile fragments that are kind of plate-like. Oh, I found them yesterday. And uh, to my recollection, they do not polarize, but they, oh, here, see that? See how there's like this clear, like, like looks like clear fluid and then it, that's different texture. Like it's like raised above that. This is a silicone granuloma, right? So from like a ruptured silicone implant or something like that, it tends to make, it looks like fat necrosis, but like extremely exuberant. And then you'll find those little plate, like clear glassy areas in there. And of course the history is important and other types of uh, foreign body and injection related, um, uh, foreign body reactions can look a lot like this. So the history is important. And as a final thing to end on, this is an example of something we see a lot in other parts of pathology, not as much in derm path, but these blue, smudgy, like spiky, angulated um, fragments of thing with a bunch of giant cell, foreign body, giant cell reaction. This is gel foam. And so probably this person had had a biopsy that they had packed with gel foam to help, you know, stop the bleeding, uh, which can, I, I've heard can be used sometimes like in alopecia biopsies and other things. Um, so I, I don't see this very often in skin, but that's a great example of what gel foam looks Thanks, like. Thanks, you too. Thank you. Once you've seen it. So now you've seen it. All right, guys, uh, that's uh, it. I have a great Friday. And for those of you at home, thanks for watching.